magandang umaga, malakan yung press corps sa ating mga bisita. Ito po yung unang pagkakataon na magsasagawa tayo ng briefing about sa isinusulong ng Duterte Administration na Federal Charter. Today we have Assistant Secretary Jonathan Malaya from the DILG. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone. Good morning to the members of the Malacanian uh, Press Corps. Uh, we are, and we'd also like to thank the uh, Presidential Communication Operations Office for uh, hosting us uh, in today's uh, press briefing. Uh, we hope this is the first of a series of uh, press briefings that we are going to conduct as directed by the President for us to intensify the campaign um, on the federal system of government. Uh, let me just um, um, address some of the issues that have come out recently uh, in the media especially on the issue of uh, the uh, sort of disagreement um, on the part of the economic managers on the fiscal cost of the federal system of government. Um, we'd like to state that uh, the way we see it, the economic managers on the record do not oppose the shift to federal system of government. No? There is an agreement on the part of the entire executive branch that we need to shift to a federal system of government. The disagreement is not on the shift. The disagreement is on the cost. No? And um, the, ex the economic managers uh, would want us to focus on preparing the economic fundamentals for federalism to be fully implemented. To them, this includes infrastructure and real dispersed regional development. Uh, in this concern, we agree with them. Uh, we agree with them that there is a need to further study the economic implications of a shift to a federal system. And therefore, uh, we also agree with them that we do not need to rush into this, no? because it's a complex and fundamental change. You know, the, the shift to a federal system being a change in the system of government is complex and fundamental. Therefore, we agree with them that um, we, this needs study and that we need to take time to be able to um, create a favorable condition for federalism to succeed. Build, 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 and train one and two has staged the oper operationalization of the shift to a federal system. We all know that build, 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 and trains one and two are for purposes of regional development, which is why we have infrastructure projects not only in, the, in Luzon, but a lot of projects also in the Visayas and Mindanao. The new constitution will set the irreversible path towards through regional growth and development, which in the final sum means national development. The members of the Constitutional um, Consultative Commission met with the um, members of the Economic Development Cluster. And uh, there was fundamental agreement between both camps that uh, to support behind the shift to uh, a federal system of government. In our continuing consultation with the public in the regions, we have seen the immense support of the people for change in our constitution. That is why we see this position of the economic managers as the beginning of the consultation process on the economic impact of the president's agenda to promote a shift to a federal system of government. Now, I emphasize the, um, the beginning of a consultation process because um, many of some of the members, uh, some of the people have this impression that because the draft constitution has been submitted to the president, it's final and can no longer be changed. Let me emphasize that the president has opened up the consultation process on the draft federal constitution. And this was announced last week by president, uh, presidential spokesman Hari Rocky himself, when he said that we are opening up the consultation process and all comments and inputs may be directed to the office of the president, to the office of the presidential spokesman, and to the Department of Interior and local government. So we are opening up this consultation process precisely because uh, we are a government united behind the desire of the president for real change. And that real change includes structural reform, which then creates a government and a society that is more able to serve the needs of all of our people. And this consultation process does not only involve the members of government, whether they be in uh, vari may, whether they be the members of the economic team, but also those in the security cluster, in the other clusters of government. And the DILG is now bringing this consultation process down to the regions as well. 
the DILG has uh, begun con the consultation process with the CONCOM uh, beginning of June, and we are continuing this uh, consultation process across the regions so that we can make the proper recommendations for the president. With that, uh, I am joined here today with two members of the Consultative Commission, uh, Professor Edmund Tayao and Attorney Susan uh, Ordinario, and I'd like to turn over to Professor Tayao. Good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I will uh, zero in on the fiscal aspects of uh, federalism, of course, uh, without uh, having to sacrifice uh, some basic uh, uh, concepts or principles that we followed as far as the drafting of the Constitution is concerned. This is uh, quite a uh, long presentation, but uh, I'm just going to zero in on the fundamentals. You have a copy of the slides anyway, so I'm uh, sure, of course, that you can uh, look into this uh, uh, in more specific uh, uh, details uh, later. No? Uh, first slide, please. So basically, it's not like uh, we, we don't have uh, uh, what's this, uh, basic uh, assumptions when we started. Let me just say at the outset that when we say federal form of government, there's no one particular model that we're looking at. And the approach of the consultative committee as the approach, as the right approach really, is to f uh, understand no, where we are right now, the context of the, of the country, no, and why we're shifting, what are the needs as far as uh, the shift is uh, concerned. No? Uh, in other words, it's not like you're going to uh, copy hook, line, and sinker what's uh, found in federal democracies like uh, the United States of America, Germany, Canada, and so on and so forth. The second consideration, there are two types of federalism. One is the coming together type of federalism, which is the classical type of federalism. This is the usual uh, suspects. No? When you search uh, the term uh, federal form or federalism in, the, in Google, uh, the first thing that you'll see would be, of course, uh, the usual suspects, the U.S., uh, Germany, Canada, and so on and so on. These are the classical type of federalism, which doesn't apply to us. In other words, these are the countries that uh, uh, first established their states. No, uh, they, are not, uh, they were not under colonial uh, control before, and uh, they started off as separate uh, states. Hence, the need for them to federate and uh, unite. In our case, we were former uh, uh, colonies, no? and the public institutions that were established uh, to us were imposed by the colonial powers that occupied uh, the Philippines. No? Hence, uh, our uh, case is comparable to uh, similar uh, countries. No? Uh, this is the uh, so-called holding together type of federalism. Uh, you have Belgium, you have Spain, you have South Africa, you have Kenya, you have Ethiopia, and so on. No? And uh, mind you, uh, we've heard, for example, that uh, some of the African countries mentioned no, uh, supposedly are backward countries. No, perhaps uh, a, a further reading would suggest that precisely when they federalized, no, they were able to settle some uh, issues no, with regard to their governance and uh, led to the improvement not only of their governance but even their economy. No? Um, hence, when we speak of federalism in the case of the Philippines, we have to look at the kind of public institutions uh, we have right now. It's not like just downloading powers without you looking at the political context. Uh, are our central public institutions ready to hold no, uh, the periphery? In other words, empowering them without necessarily losing them in terms of coordination. The idea here really is to uh, uh, do some house cleaning. No? Where we are right now, what are the limitations of the current uh, setup and uh, uh, how are we to use the uh, opportunity no? uh, to change the setup, uh, reform, uh, reform public institutions by way of changing the constitution. That, so those are the premises or the premises that we use. So uh, those are the key principles, strong federal government to keep the country as one. So that's uh, what I was trying to explain earlier. No? You're empowering the regions without necessarily weakening the center. Next slide, please. So if you look at, um, if you look at uh, how we came up with the uh, uh, fiscal uh, considerations, the powers, uh, we're always uh, schooled uh, by several uh, groups that uh, form follows function. Of course, we know that. And it's not like uh, we uh, sort of uh, imagined uh, simply what needs to be considered uh, when it comes to the drafting. We know for a fact that you can't go to numbers without looking at what functions will be downloaded. 
No? Uh, in other words, we learn from our decentralization experience in 1991, where we simply devolve functions without transition and fixing the amount of monies that will be given to the local governments. You see, this allows me to segue to the difference between the unitary uh, decentralized setup and the proposed federal setup. Under the unitary decentralized setup, your local governments are mere agents of the state which means they merely perform functions which are delegated no, uh, to them by the central by the by the state which is the central government when we shift to uh, unitary to federal uh, form of government, the federated regions are not local governments let me emphasize that they are not local governments in fact under the principle of shared sovereignty they perform uh, the same powers with respect to their exclusive in other words the same powers in terms of uh, uh, effectiveness. No? So uh, there are some uh, uh, functions which are exclusive to them, like local governments, which also explains why there is no particular article on local governments in the proposed constitution. You know, you don't need a particular article on local governments because local governments are now directly under the federated regions. So there are some implications also as a result when we look at that. In other words, there are some guiding principles that we use in when it comes to um, uh, fiscal considerations, so fiscal prudence, uh, the sh reasonable sharing of revenues. For example, when we came up with the 50-50 sharing, again, it's not like uh, we simply guessed it. Uh, 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 how do we how we do the sharing? What's the logic behind the equal 50-50 uh, sharing? For example, uh, of course, if you compare weak regions, like let's say Region 8 uh, and uh, say Region 5 with NCR, of course, NCR uh, obviously is uh, already strong as a, as a region. In fact, uh, there were considerable the debates in the committee when we uh, decided whether the NCR should be a federated region or not. Now, uh, when we finally came to, uh, the, to an agreement, uh, NCR remains a federated region but uh, would be getting the same uh, equal uh, share as far as the revenue is concerned, mainly because it's assumed that NCR can uh, generate more revenues compared to the other regions. So the share that will come from the uh, from uh, federal revenues uh, uh, to NCR as a federated region would most likely be used uh, mainly to sustain many of its uh, services and public uh, uh, services that it already offers. No? But with respect to smaller or weaker uh, regions, it will allow them to uh, do more capital uh, expenditures, which is basically what is needed as far as the uh, periphery is concerned or the other regions are concerned. So in a way, uh, you can imagine no, some uh, uh, leveling that's going to happen if uh, the proposed federal structure happens. So there are, of course, you don't do this without uh, taking into consideration the essential federal expenditures first. So whenever we're asked, sa mga galing yung budget for national defense, for uh, sovereign uh, debt servicing, so on, actually, you don't touch that. That's the first principle that you do. No? In other words, any, any consideration of how much amount of money will be brought down would, should take into consideration first the fundamentals. It's not like you're going to, again, consistent with the principle that you have a strong central government. You should make sure that uh, those fundamentals are taken care of before you share funds. Second, you don't just share funds. In the first place, again, uh, using the principle of form follows function, in, you're not just giving away money. You're, in fact, giving money because you're giving functions to the federated region. You're empowering them. And so... Whenever uh, some cost uh, is uh, given to uh, the public for consideration, the first thing that you should ask is, what, are, uh, what do these costs uh, uh, refer to? Okay? Are we assuming, for example, that uh, the existing bureaucracy at the national level will be the same and uh, will just be replicated or duplicated as far as the federated region is concerned? If that is the case, then definitely you will bloat the, uh, the budget. Second, if, uh, for example, you're going to bring down some of these powers, does it mean that uh, you are, uh, at the outset, going to create new offices? Aren't we already, uh, don't, don't we already have existing regional offices to begin with? In other words, if you look at the line agency, and these, and these line agencies are the same line agencies that will be brought down to the federated region level, if they are already existing, does it mean that you still have to create them? Of course, I, I'm sure, of course, that you know already the answer to that. The point really is, when you bring down powers which are uh, uh, which already have existing bureaucracies, you're simply reconfiguring as to which level of government that they will now be answerable to. 
which level of government already have political authority over them. So what's going to happen is just to reconfigure the federated region or the region, which means that in effect, you are amalgamating currently fragmented local governments. There was this, uh, there was this uh, comment uh, that it's not the 1987 constitution that's uh, to be faulted, why we have fragmented uh, local governments. Of course, to a certain extent, you can always argue there's no direct uh, relation. No? But in terms of policy analysis, you can very well understand that the 1987 Constitution enumerates not two, but four levels of government at the outset. The assumption then is even if, say, municipalities or component cities are under provinces, it doesn't mean that the provinces actually control them, which means that in terms of expending uh, power, it's as if you're suggesting that all of these are, in fact, independent uh, entities. What you're supposed to do is to ensure that while they have autonomy, there is really, uh, uh, there are uh, simply, uh, was this uh, uh, incentives, in these incentives for them to uh, work together or not to work together. This is basically the principle, again, that uh, guided us in, in terms of uh, designing the uh, uh, federated regions. Next slide. It's not like uh, the transition, when it happens, let's say, uh, of course, we're, if you're looking at timing, uh, we're uh, of the thinking that it's not really the committee that's uh, to decide the, when, the, uh, when the plebiscite happens. Again, it uh, depends on uh, very political uh, decisions uh, to make. But the actual transition, if you are going to look at the draft, regardless of timing, actually starts at 2022. So existing public, uh, existing bureaucracies will not change immediately, even if, for example, plebiscite happens on 2019, and let's say the first uh, elections, whether regional or uh, national, happens, uh, uh, let's say 2020 uh, or 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 uh, yeah, 2021. No, so uh, in other words, you're not suggesting that all these uh, transitions no would immediately take place, and in fact, it should happen in phases. So again, you're managing the, uh, the transition. It's like transferring from your current uh, house to another. Of course, at, uh, yung una, paglipat mo ng bahay, medyo magulo, medyo mahirap. Pero pag naka-adjust ka na, mas madali na lang. Uh, next slide. You will see that there are particular articles in the draft constitution. Sabi nila, Papano ka naglagay ng figures doon e wala kang expenditure assignments? When we say expenditure assignments, uh, sirs, ma'am, you say these are the powers that are downloaded to the federated uh, regions and retained at the federal level. So yun yung expe kaya ka expenditure assignment, ibig sabihin, ito yung puder na ikaw ang namamahala. Ikaw ang nanga uh, yung puder kasi, yun yung nangangailangan ng pera. So when you transfer powers, you transfer monies as well. If you notice, this uh, somehow departs from uh, the, the, the uh, what's this, process that uh, uh, we had uh, when we decentralized in 1991. We downloaded uh, several uh, functions, but one, we did not uh, look into the existing bureaucracy then. It, what happened was uh, essentially duplicated uh, these offices no, uh, at the local level. Second, we did not bring down monies. We simply brought down and gave them powers which they cannot even exercise uh, uh, on their own. No? Uh, and uh, through the years, okay, through the years, uh, what happened was there were several functions that were even centralized. Look at social welfare alone and for peace. Social welfare, even if you don't devolve it, if you look at uh, current literature, is uh, uh, basically the province of the local governments. But even if it's already provided for the local government, uh, without amending the local government code, uh, the central government has this tendency to come up with programs that essentially dilutes the powers already supposedly given to local government units. So ito yung binabago natin. No? If you have already given powers down, uh, it doesn't mean that it has to be diluted just so because it's uh, uh, just because it's not effective. Perhaps the effectiveness has something to do with coordination more than just giving it the, down to the uh, lower level or getting it back at the national level. Next slide, uh, which I already explained. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of fiscal administration, these are the powers of the federal government. No? I need not enumerate them. Uh, these are the usual. Of course, when you're talking of foreign affairs, uh, monetary policy, no? uh, uh, international trade, the national defense, and so on and so forth. In fact, 
I, I'd like to emphasize that national defense, including security, we retained it at the federal level. It's not something that you can uh, share no, with the federated region. It doesn't mean that because you're a federal government, uh, you're a federal form of government, that all the offices that are at the federal level would be the same as far as the federated regions are concerned. No, not necessarily. It will depend, again, on the kind of powers that are brought down, the kind of powers that are shared, and the kind of functions which are specifically provided for as far as the different levels of government are concerned. Next slide. So again, following the powers, you now have expenditure assignment. And if you notice, I mentioned in terms of powers, national defense, security, foreign affairs. So consistent with the powers, you have your expenditure assignment, which means your uh, division of powers is essentially your expenditure assignments. Next slide. Uh, so the federal government's powers and funds are intact. So I, I have no idea why it has to be asked saan magagaling ang pera pambayad ng utang, saan magagaling pera pambayad sa uh, pang-sustain ng national defense. Because essentially, these are not touched. No? The funds for the exclusive powers including defense and security, foreign affairs, sovereign debt servicing, fiscal and monetary policy and administration uh, we, uh, uh, under DOF, uh, DOF and the BSP remain intact. Congress retains the power to appropriate these funds in the GAA. Next slide. These are the only powers which we downloaded to the federated region. Uh, essentially, if you notice, these are uh, in fact consistent with uh, uh, even the, lo the existing local government code. Uh, planning is there, creation of uh, sources of revenue, economic zones, financial administration, and so on and so forth. Infrastructure development, transportation, so on. Nagdagdag lang. Let me, let me say at the outset also that uh, we had to put there in the exclusive powers uh, local governments, uh, uh, real property tax administration, and the uh, business process and licensing. Not because we're assuming na wala ng local governments and nasa federated region na lahat ng revenues. No. Nilagay lang namin doon to make sure that this will not be taken back by the federal government. No? Kasi maglalagay na ngayon, yung, yung local government code more remains effective under the proposed constitution. If, we're now 1987 constitution, may mga presidential decrees pa kasi hindi pa lahat siya na-repeal. So pag may bago ng constitution, hindi ibig sabihin, repeal na yung local government code. So may ira pa din, nandiyan pa din yung local, nandiyan pa din yung mga probinsya mo, munisipyo mo, city mo. Kung gusto nilang baguhin yun, sila na magde-decision sa federated region level kung babaguhin nila. So walang, walang ma-de-disrupt. So again, hindi ko alam bakit sinasabi lang may disruption. In fact, on top of the sharing, next slide, you have this fiscal administration. So you're allowing leeway no, for the federated region to further increase their revenue depending on the kind of economic activity that they see fit uh, for uh, their uh, uh, needs. No? Next slide. So ito yon, no, sources of revenue for federated regions. This is uh, given the power to collect the following. This is under Section 2, Article uh, 13 of the proposed uh, constitution. There is also an assurance of fiscal discipline, next slide, among federated regional governments. This is uh, found in the Section 1, Article 12. Let me emphasize, it says there, no double taxation shall be allowed. We can discuss that uh, further later. No? Let me uh, jump to uh, the Federal Intergovernmental Commission. Next slide. So you have, a, you have an entity there that ensures no, coordination between the different levels of government no, and recommend the legislation to Congress and also look at the sharing uh, also with re uh, respect to revenues. Next slide, you have the composition of the FIGC. You know, I'm, I'm doing all this so that, uh, uh, you know, even if we don't have to go out of our way to read the draft, at least you now have the salient points. Now, next slide. You have the powers and duties of the uh, Federal Intergovernmental Commission. Next slide. Next slide. Yan. Yan yung pinaka-importante. Ang binababa mong funds, no, is when you say 50-50, you're referring only to uh, particular taxes, customs, duties, uh, and uh, so on. No? So, ang lumalabas, one-third lang ang bababa sa federated region. Kasama na yung ira ng local governments doon. Kasi sila na yung magde-decision nga, no, kung paano later, if they are going to retain the current ERA system under the local government code, unless they Repeal it. Next slide. Okay, so yan yung 50-50 sharing, no? Uh, on top of the revenue sources that are uh, already given them. There's a provision that empowers Federal Transition Commission to adjust the formula. So, merong ganong uh, flexibility. Next slide. All the funds lodged in the federated regions are from the existing pools of funds from the national government. Hence, the deficit ceiling should not be breached. Let me emphasize that. It should not affect credit standing. The same funds are moved from one pocket to another. In other words, you're just bringing down powers, and so you're bringing down funds. 
Okay? Hindi mo din doble yung existing bureaucracy. Federalism transfers control of the same funds from national federal government to the regional governments. Next slide. And this is the most important thing. If you look at the incremental cost, okay, the incremental cost, uh, as far as our uh, numbers are concerned, would not reach 20 billion. In fact, all those costs, which are directly because of the shift from unitary to federal, would amount only to a little over 13 billion pesos. So, uh, if you look at the uh, was this the presentation of the Department of Finance and the uh, NEDA, uh, we need we even need to reconcile it. And so, I don't see any uh, was this uh, radical. Uh, difference or what, the difference really is with the assumption. Ano bang kasama doon sa computation ng mga ahensyang yon at ano yung kasama doon sa computation namin? In other words, what to me simply emphasizes is that there is need for further discussions on the technical aspect. How I would have hoped, even the CONCOM would have hoped as a body, that there is really coordination first between the different agencies before we come up with, oh, ito yung cost na sinasabi, ito yung cost na sinasabi. Uh, apart from that, let me also emphasize, no? let's say for the sake of argument that the budget that, that is 243.5 billion is really the cost. Note, tingnan nyo lang yung increase ng budget from, wag na yung, uh, yung pinaka, ma, pinaka uh, Batagal, no? Yung 2014 to 2018 lang, we've increased the budget by 25.07% already. Which means on average, year on year, we're increasing budget by 350 to 500 billion pesos. So let's just say, no? and I'm not saying I agree with the 253.5 billion incremental cost. It, does it not fall well within the 350 to 500 billion uh, increase in the total budget of the government? So, next slide. These are the, cav the caveats. The amount used, obviously, uh, would be the existing figures only. So, uh, based on 2018. Senate staffing may double. Kamadadagdagan yung Senate bo. But take note, yung tumatakbo doon regional na, hindi na national. Pangalawa, dahil mas marami sila, they will no longer have to uh, chair several committees. Ang computation mo kasi ng cost, hindi by membership, by committees. So dahil mas marami ng senators ngayon, hindi na kailangan dalawa, tatlo yung committee nila. No? Malamang mag-isa-isa na lang sila. It's computed with, well within the 5% increase in GA and will happen by 2022. Take note that this computation does not even factor savings from the rationalization of the national bureau. Kasi, kasi ibababa mo yung functions, oh, yung mga uh, empleyado, hindi mo na kailangan dun yung iba. In fact, we have a very top-heavy national bureaucracy. In the long run, we can expect even more savings than expenditures. Next slide. Ito yung importante dito. Effect on economy. Mayroon daw layoffs. There are, we don't see any drastic change occurring after ratification. We can just read the what's provided for there. That's it. So uh, I hope that uh, there will be more opportunity to discuss the uh, more technical aspects because at the end of the day, pag may sinabi kang cost kagad, it, it sends a different message. So uh, sa akin lang, baka naman meron lang ibang consideration na hindi nakita namin Oh, hindi din nila nakita. So, all the more that it means there has to be further discussion. Salamat po. Thank you, Professor Tayao. Professor na professor talaga. <laughs> Let me turn over to Attorney Susan Ordinario, member also of the CONCOM. Thank you, ASEC. Uh, good morning to everybody. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to meet all of you and to participate in this presentation by the CONCOM. And... Uh, let me segue from the last uh, presentation of uh, Professor Tayo and uh, take a few lines from the presentation of uh, ASEC Malaya. You know, for every activity that the government undertakes, there will always be costs. But a government does not exist only to spend, to earn and spend the exact amount. Uh, a government is there not just to to hire people or to buy uh, services or to buy uh, items, goods to give to the people in exchange for income. A government is there to serve the interests of the people. And in any kind of shift, there will be costs, but the shift will always be in conjunction with reforms or benefits that cannot be costed in pesos and cents. This is what we call the cost-benefit ratio. And uh, 
I believe that uh, while uh, there were costs presented to you relative to the, ex the, the very act of federalizing or shifting, there were uh, other benefits that have been uh, introduced in the charter which we had to incorporate because we cannot, we cannot see the reason why we should uh, have a constitutional review and a constitutional revision without already incorporating certain reform measures that are very necessary to ensure the welfare of our country and our people. So on top of all of these uh, structural reforms, which will naturally have costs, we have instituted several other areas of reform. That is the reason why we need to revise the Constitution. First of this, of course, is the political reforms. We have defined the uh, provision of the 1987 Constitution on uh, anti-political dynasty, which for 32 years they have not uh, really identified as uh, referring to whatever particular relationship should be allowed. And uh, we believe that in the consultations that we've been having with the people, this is one of the areas of reform that the people are really, really, really very, very interested in and very interested to see instituted in our government. The other very important political reform measure that we incorporated is the political party reform. Okay, so that's, that's really very important because we are trying to incorporate a system of uh, participation, democratic participation by the people in which political parties become instruments of the people's exercise of their sovereign will. And uh, in so doing, we had to specifically uh, provide for an anti-party switching or anti-turncoatism provision. This may not look very, um, very vital in terms of, pr of cost, no? but uh, in terms of the benefit to the people, I don't think there's uh, a way of putting a value, a monetary value to this. Uh, as they say, what price progress? And then of course, we have introduced very, very important reforms in the judicial system. Many, many uh, instances that have uh, taken place in which people's lives and people's hopes have been shattered by the failure of our judicial system to respond to the need for justice. There has been a great divide between law and the delivery of justice. And so, thanks to the expertise and the experience of three of the members of the CONCOM who were justices of the Supreme Court, they were the ones who designed the reforms in the judicial system. They came up with four superior courts. One is the Supreme Court, which remains supreme. And then we have the, uh, the Federal Constitutional Court, the Federal Administrative Court, and the Federal Electoral Court. What is the purpose of this specialization? Specifically, it is to ensure a speedy delivery of justice. I'm sure all of you are aware that cases in the Supreme Court can last for 15 to 20 years. In fact, according to the justices, they, they uh, see about 10 to 12,000 cases filed every year before the Supreme Court. And of these, only about 50% get resolved within a year. What happens now to the other 6,000 that have not been resolved? It will spill over to the next year. Okay. Now, the next item of reform that we wanted to ensure is the, uh, the area of, econ of economic and uh, business activities. We said the 1987 Constitution uh, closed the door to uh, any change in the voting requirement for businesses. We think that this is not, this is not uh, good for the economy because economies change. The uh, business climate changes. 
and perhaps there will be a need for future reforms. However, we feel that it was not uh, right for us to make that decision at this point in time, considering that we, did, we didn't really have the, the liberty to extend our, our researches and our studies beyond the six month period. And this is, uh, the economy is something very, vi very, very volatile that we cannot spend too much time on studying it, but we do not want to shackle our country to a, a very strict 60-40 sharing of uh, voting uh, interests. So what we did was to, uh, you know, put a little leeway for our country to be able to adjust to changing economies by saying that Congress may later, by law, decide to change this strict uh, sharing. Then we also instituted uh, uh, economic reforms in the, in, the, in the sense that we raised the Philippine cons, uh, Competition Commission to the level of a, a constitutional body. Why? Because we feel that it is important now, especially if there will be any any prospective uh, change in the voting requirements of businesses for a, a body to be strictly independent in its decision to, to control cartels and monopolies in trade. So basically, those reforms cannot be uh, computed in terms of pesos. But uh, the, the benefit to the, to the country, to the people, to our economy will be long lasting and it will surpass generations. Then of course we also looked at the basic uh, provisions on human rights. We expanded it to include the second and the third generation rights. I'm sure you will read that in the draft. The important uh, aspect of this is to expand the the ability of our people to demand rights that are due to them. The second generation rights are to be, uh, to be exercised based on progressive realization, on the cap capability of the country to meet these rights. The third generation, of course, are the rights for, on the ecology. We have seen the effect of uh, abuses committed against the environment in the case of Boracay. We do not want that to happen again. So we are giving that right to the people to demand that our uh, stakeholders, especially the people who are engaged in, bus in the business of using the environment, exploring the environment, they must exercise the responsibility and they must be liable for any degradation that they bring in. I think basically that's, that goes to the uncomputable portion of the Constitution. We have shown you the economic uh, side, the actual financial uh, costs, and I'm giving you now, I have just given you now, the benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Susan. Um, since constitutional reform is such a complex subject and it runs the gamut of uh, Philippine society, we'll just hold uh, succeeding press briefings so that we can focus also on the specific aspects, maybe on the the Bill of Rights, on the judiciary and the legislative, uh, so that we can have a um, more intense discussion on those specific topics in the future because we have very limited time. But let, let me just emphasize before we go to the uh, question and answer portion. Um, there were several assumptions made when NEDA and the DOF uh, made their uh, computations as to the deficit, as to the cost of federalism. As a matter of fact, uh, I heard about different numbers. NEDA, um, said it was around 243 billion. DOF had a different figure, 320 billion. So there's also disagreement among them. No? What does this mean? This means that there has to be more technical discussions. No? Um, the assumptions that the economic managers made um, were assumptions they made themselves. No? It, these were not assumptions made in consultation with the CONCOM. So what we did was to bridge the gap. The meeting with the CONCOM and the economic managers precisely was for the meeting, was for, for them to bridge the gap so that the CONCOM can explain to the economic managers um, what exactly is Bayanihan federalism. 
and uh, Professor Tayo has already explained to us that this is not your uh, run-of-the-mill Wikipedia, Google mo lang na federalism, and then you make assumptions on that. This is a designed for the Philippines uh, type of federalism, which in their opinion would only have a cost of around 20 billion. But let me say, let me say, um, either it's 20 billion or 243 billion or 320 billion, I think we can afford it. Why? I've been in government for so long. In the last budget hearing that I attended, the entire returned, unutilized money by the national government, which all of the government agencies returned to DBM because it was not utilized, 600 billion. Unutilized, returned. You know, those in government know this. At the end of the year, if you have not obligated your budget, you will have to return it to DBM. The national government uh, returned 600 billion unutilized funds. Now, that means we have the money for federalism. Um, and let me just emphasize, as mentioned by Professor Taya, we are not going to spend this in one, yeah. in one fell swoop. The assumption which uh, the economic managers made was, we're going to do this immediately. There's going to be a transition plan, a clear roadmap across several years, could be 10 years, and we can spread out the cost uh, in, in those years. And that will negate whatever uh, fiscal deficit we may have, that will negate whatever concerns we may have, that there will be mass layoffs, which we are st stating clearly now, there will be no mass layoffs. Why? Because employees, if needed, will just shift from one boss to the other. If, for example, um, uh, a certain sector of society or government is devolved to uh, the regional governments, they will simply shift from the national government to the local governments or to the regional government. So how can there be mass layoffs? The intent of federalism is to improve basic services, and if basic services we will be entailed, then we are not meeting the benefits of federalism. We have designed, the CONCOM has designed a uh, federalism which we believe addresses the needs of our country, and I hope that the Filipino people will give us a chance to implement this um, hopefully within the administration of President Duterte and begin the transition immediately afterwards. Thank you very much. MPC, you have questions? No more? Uh, Ina, questions? We can still accommodate three to four questions. To um, anyone from the panel, is the timeline or the target to con have the plebiscite by 2019 still doable considering the um, consultations that are expected to um, be done, as he mentioned? Perhaps the better uh, agency or official to uh, answer that would be either Congress uh, or probably even COMELEC or uh, the best, uh, in the best position would be the executive department. Our, uh, our uh, mandate is to uh, review the 1987 constitution and come up with a draft. And we've done that already. Sir, as you continue to work on the draft constitution, how are you also addressing the um, concerns of some senators about the shift of federalism? Um, basically, many of them are saying that it's really not a priority. So how are you doing both? All right. Um, when we say that the priority is, let's say, poverty or economic development, uh, again, it depends how you are going to approach uh, the problem. Uh, even if uh, you're going to come up with programs like Four Peace, if you are not going to ensure that there will be significant change in terms of investment at the local level, in terms of employment at the local level, in terms of production at the local level, this would all be, uh, if at all, would result to something positive, may not be sustainable. And the numbers can bear me out in this regard. If you look at the poverty index of the country, despite the continually increasing budget for four piece, it does not uh, make any dent. Okay? So the problem is in the mechanism. It's not in the programs. Yeah. Ina, let me just address your question. We're positive that we can uh, convince the senators. Uh, the president has invited the senators and members of Congress to a dialogue on federalism. Aside from that, the, uh, the presidential legislative liaison office 
uh, together with the executive branch, will be briefing all senators, their staff, and the media, <coughs> covering them on the proposed constitution and on the issue of federalism. Also, um, although some uh, senators have mentioned negative um, comments about federalism, the fact remains that the Senate has not yet passed anything that would amount to a repudiation of federalism. The Senate committee, uh, led by Senator uh, Kiko Pangilinan, has not even issued a committee report. Uh, the Senate as a whole has not come out with a resolution on uh, federalism. And the House of Representatives, on the other hand, has passed a resolution uh, seeking the Senate's concurrence to the convening of a constituent assembly. That, up to now, is still uh, spending in the Senate. So the final decision of the Senate has not yet been made. So that, that gives uh, advocates of federalism uh, the time to talk to our senators and begin that process of dialogue. And the president will be the one leading that uh, process of dialogue. And uh, moreover, there are senators who, uh, who are supportive of federalism. Of course, number one is uh, Senator Coco Pimentel, the president of PDP Laban, the party which has advocated for federalism since 1982. So we are positive that uh, in the next um, few months, uh, we'll be able to uh, build a healthy discussion with the senators in, on this topic. Okay. Uh, Deo, De Guzman, RMN. Magandang umaga po. Pahina uh, po, inilatag niyo yung mga positive effects ng uh, federal form of government. And uh, coming from the consultative committee, Ano po ba yung mga nakikita nyo namang mga negative effect, posibleng negative effect ng uh, transition ng government from unitary to federal form? Kasi ang mga nagiging, uh, uh, nagko-comment po ng magkakaroon negative is out from outside of the Constitutional Committee. So sa inyo pong part, ano po ang nakikita nyo posibleng negative effect or a factor that would uh, make this uh, transition fail? Would you like me to answer that? Yes, ma'am. Basically, the only one aspect that we are a little wary of is that there may be an initial cost, an initial cost in the shift. Because uh, in downloading the functions to the regions, there may be people in the bureaucracy who may not want to be transferred or who may opt to, to be separated from the service. This is one of the negatives because definitely we'll have to provide for the, for the uh, cost of uh, retiring them or, or separating them. But uh, during the transition, all of these things will have to be discussed in the transition commission. So the best possible uh, approach to this problem of the civil service can be uh, negotiated within the transition commission so that it will not have too much effect on the people who will be affected as well as on the economy or on the, on the costs of the transition. To my mind, that is the only one very big problem. Although uh, we tried to avoid more disruption by in fact uh, advocating for 18 regions because as, as of now, we already have the 18 administrative regions, which will now make it easy for the transition to take place. Yun lang, ang sa akin. I don't know about the other members, but to my mind, that is one of the most uh, difficult aspects. Another question is, papaano po yung political dynasty? Alam naman po natin na ang uh, mga ating mga mambabatas ngayon, eh talagang parang kapag isinabatas nila, ipupukpuk nila sa sarili nila yan. So, papaano po natin, ma, how are we going to strike a balance with, on that political dynasty issue? But in fact, uh, in one meeting that we had with the House of Representatives, they were not averse to the anti-political dynasty measure. Um, they said they are, they are uh, amenable and they see the benefits, but they have their own uh, apprehensions about other items relative to the, to the term limits. So nakikita niyo po ba na kung ano po yung inilagay niyo doon sa inyong draft constitution ay yun din ang ipapasa ng Congress in terms of the political dynasty issue? We believe so. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh, last question na tayo. Oh, two, last two, uh, Pia, then Joseph. Sir, for the record, can we get your comment on the 253 billion estimate of NEDA? 
243. No, I think I'll give that to Professor. to Professor Tao. What, what comment is specifically? Uh, because that's because my Neda presentation. Because Neda had an estimate that uh, the shift to federalism would cost an additional 253 billion. Yun nga, kaya nga, ano yung assumptions? That, that's basically what I was trying to explain earlier. No? From the most basic uh, uh, principle to the detailed assumptions that the CONCOM come up, came up with. So this is uh, how we based our own computation. So doon kasi mag-iiba yun eh. Saan mo yung pagkakagasto saan? Alimbawa, if you look at the DOF uh, computation, may nilagay pa silang ira ng uh, federated region. Eh may revenue share na yun. Okay? Pangalawa, yung sinasabi na kailangan mo ng, addition, ng offices sa federated region. Actually, meron ka ng existing offices doon. So, marami kang pwedeng uh, options doon. Now, now, let's say for the sake of argument, nagagasto ka ng additional na capital o building. Hindi naman siguro mag a sa 320 billion. If you're looking at 18 federated regions, in fact, hindi pa 18 yan kasi tatanggalin mo doon sa computation yung Bangsamoro, may sarili kasi sila eh. No? At uh, ang, ang uh, NCR, I don't think kailangan ng NCR ng additional na kapitolyo din. Anyway, to make the long story short, let's just say for the sake of argument, maglalagay ka ng offices dito sa mga ito. Uh, hindi naman siguro mag a yan sa 1 billion per capital. At kahit na pagpalagay mong 1 billion per capital, 18 billion lang yan. So, hindi ko pa din makita yung cost na aabot ng 320 billion. At uulitin ko po, pag tinignan mo yung 320 billion o 243.5 billion, it is still well within the usual increase in the annual budget of the country. At katulad ng sinabi ni ASEC, maganda pa yung nadagdag doon. Every year, may bumabalik na hindi, na hindi nagagamit na 600 billion. So, again, Pag tinignan mo, saan dito papasok yung tinatawag na breaching ng uh, budget uh, deficit limit? At saan dito, mang, saan dito mag impact yung sinasabi na pambayad natin sa sovereign debt? At saan dito makikita yung 90% na layoff? Kumbaga, baka meron sila pang ibang detalye na hindi namin nakita. Kaya nga ang sinasabi namin, mas maganda siguro kung mas ma haba pa yung panahon na mag-uusap-usap. Pero ang sinasabi lang namin sa komite, hindi naman namin hinulaan yung mga provision. Kumbaga, at the outset, bago kami mag-draft, at katulad nga nung sinasabi, form follows function, expenditure assignment muna, pinagdebatihan muna namin ano yung mga poder na ibababa. Yun yung expenditure assignment mo, at saka namin nilagyan ng cost. So, sinunod namin yung proseso. Okay. Let me emphasize, no. Uh, there was uh, this. There, there was uh, wrong assumptions made when the uh, budgets, when the costs was writ, was made by NEDA because and DOF because they never even came to the CONCOM and asked the CONCOM about the details of the constitution. Remember, not all the details can be put in the constitution. There are underlying studies and discussion papers that come with the constitution. So. Um, I've heard, for example, that some of the uh, people who have criticized the draft assumed that in a federal system, the entire bureaucracy of the national government will be duplicated in the regional government. So, ibig sabihin, kanya-kanyang civil service, kanya-kanyang COA, kanya-kanyang DBM, kanya-kanyang uh, Department of Education, Department of Health. So, when you compute that, talagang malaki yun. When in fact, what's going to happen is, you have to look at the expenditure assignments, what goes to which region, and then kung, for example, the Department of Education is going to be devolved, lilipat lang yung mga empleyado from getting their salaries from DepEd National to getting their salaries from the regional DepEd. That's what we're saying. That the assumptions which they made, uh, we feel are mistaken because it bloated the cost. So what is the solution here? The solution here is more technical discussions more technical discussions between both the, the, the con commissioners and the DBM and the NEDA so that lahat tayo hindi pa iba-iba ng figures. Because the problem is the NEDA has its own figures, the DOF has its own figures, and the CONCON -CON has its own figures. When in fact, it's the CONCON -CON that should be listened to because it's them who prepared the draft federal constitution. And the DOF and NEDA are simply commenting on the draft of the 
CONCOM. So we are prepared to work with them in the future. There will be f more technical discussions so that, that we can come to an agreement on the actual cost of the Bayanihan federalism. <coughs> Magdagdag ako, no? kasi ngayon ko lang nakita yung notes ko no? when, when I participated in the draft. There are at least uh, three main concerns. One, there's a need to clarify assumptions no? in the Department of uh, Finance's estimate under Scenario 1, which is basically amounting to 7.1% of GDP deficit. And in Scenario 2, 3.2%. So again, ano yung assumptions doon when we, when we talk about... Uh, uh, scenario, when we talk about the details of the two scenarios presented. Second, it's interesting if you look at the estimates uh, that they came up with, no, that the estimate of federal government spending in current system and scenario one is the same. So it's as, in other words, this confirms our, uh, our thinking that perhaps uh, the assumption is nothing is going to change uh, as far as the national government agencies and national bureaucracy is concerned. Pero kailangan mo ngang irrationalize kasi top-heavy ka uh, if you will uh, apply the same as it is right now. If you notice, ilang administrasyon na yung uh, dumaan at uh, ilang administrasyon yung nag-attempt na mag-rationalize ng bureaucracy. Ito nga yung pinakamagandang pagkakataon kasi pag binaba mo yung mga ahensya, titingnan mo ngayon, meron bang mga offices na hindi mo na kailangan sa taas kasi binaba mo na na hindi mo naman i-create sa federated region kasi may mga regional offices ka naman doon. No? So, uh, doon sa scenario 1, pareho eh, na 3.2 billion. So, dinagdagan mo lang yung cost. This may not be the case because the size of federal government spending should therefore be much lower. You're talking of the same pie. Okay? So, kung yung existing pie mo ngayon, eh, 80% pagpalagay mo yung uh, uh, binibig na nasa national government. Ang ginawa mo lang ngayon, hinati mo pa yung 80%, nagbaba ka pa ng 10-20% na cost, na, na revenue na nasa federal government at binaba mo. Yan yun, no, yung nasa slide. Yung one-third ng total revenue. Kasi tax revenues lang yung hinati ng 50-50. Meron kang non-tax revenues. Which means, this will still uh, sustain the capacity of the central government to continue assistance with LGUs as they see fit. Ito yung tinatawag namin na spending power. Pag merong hindi kaya si federated region at medyo kaya ng federal government na punan, pwedeng pumasok yun, spending power. So hindi mo hini pinahina yung central government. Bagkus, pinalakas mo nang sa ganun kahit na lumakas lalo yung federated region kasi uh, pinagsama-sama mo yung mga LGUs. Hindi pinagsama-sama na may kinulaps ka o meron kang inabolish. Hindi, you gave them incentives to make sure they coordinate. Planning pa lang, mag-work na sila. Hindi katulad ngayon na downloading ang ginagawa mong plan by RDC na hindi naman nag-merge. No? So, naglagay ka ng mekanismo doon. So, hindi ko makita. Pangatlo, bakit doon sa estimate meron pa silang black grant for Bangsamoro? Eh, wala na yun. Meron ka nang bang sa Moro Organic Law. Eh. Okay? And let's say for the sake of argument, uh, ire-retain mo si 9054. Sabihin lang natin no, na hindi BOL yung magiging operative. Okay? Pero bago ka na ang constitution. So meron ka ng federated region na automatically create doon sa bang sa Moro in place of arm. So hindi na black grant ang pinag-uusapan natin. So sa madalit sabi, may mga cost na na doble. Kaya nga, ang, ang, ang sinasabi namin dito, baka mas maganda kung patuloy yung pag-uusap. Alamin natin ano yung binabudgetan natin. Baka hindi mo na kailangan lagyan kasi tinanggal mo na, nilipat mo na. On, last na lang, sir. On another topic, do you, still, do you, need, uh, do you believe, sir, that uh, there's a need to reconvene the CONCOM after you consolidate all the suggestions from the public consultation, sir? Well, we will leave that to the President on what's his uh, decision on that matter. But moving forward, um, the President uh, has not yet transmitted to Congress officially the draft constitution. It was just mentioned in the SONA, uh, but it has not been transmitted. So what's happening now is an interagency committee has been convened, getting the comments of NEDA, DOF, all of the departments of government. It's being brought together, uh, and an interagency committee is consolidating all of these comments. And then we will forward all of these comments um, 
try to find some agreement as what we're do doing now with the economic managers and give the president a final draft um, basing it on the work of the CONCOM. And once that has been done, the president will then officially transmit it to Congress. So who will be making the final draft, sir? It will be an interagency committee uh, with the office of the president there, the DILG, the DOJ, and other government agencies. But doesn't that defeat the purpose of having a CONCOM? No, it doesn't because, um, as I said, the CONCOM is simply recommendatory to the president. They made a recommend recommendation to the president, and uh, the president n now wants to hear all sides of the of the, the all s all comments about the CONCOM draft. So, the, of course, that gives him the leeway to get comments from all. And the interagency committee, which is working on the CONCOM draft, will also include members of the CONCOM. That's what I forgot to say. We will work with them, not, not uh, in cross purposes with them. Because as I said, in doing this, we need their inputs as well. So it's going to be a joint executive branch CONCOM uh, work. What's our timeline for all of this? Uh, we're supposed, we have actually received a lot of uh, uh, co co uh, comments already. Um, um, maybe in the next briefing, I'll be able to give you a more definite uh, answer to that question. Okay, last question. Joseph Morrow. Okay, Asik Malayo. Are we already starting with the info drive? Can we say this is a formal start of the info drive that you're going to do? For well, the, or I, I understand there are groundworks already, mm -hmm. the ILG has been doing, but as far as the new directive to have an info drive, is this it? Is this the start? Well, we, this is actually a continuation, if I may say so. It's just a simply a continuation. Um, the DILG started working with the CONCOM in June. And immediately after uh, the CONCOM finished its draft, we continued working uh, with them. We bring them to our road shows all over the country. Uh, but maybe you're correct in saying that now what we have is an entire government approach. Uh, it is not simply the DILG who's working on this. The PCOO <laughs> is now on board. Uh, the Commission on Higher Education is now on board. Other government agencies are now on board because um, the president has directed us to intensify the public awareness campaign. That's why we now have other agencies working with us. Okay, sir. On the issue of the ser debt servicing, see Professor Tayo Tama, no? Central government ni magbabayad para na. Okay. Sir, I guess the nearest concept, in, in terms of, a, uh, as a concept, ang pinakamalapit natin pwedeng i-illustrate yung federal regions, eh, pwede yung arm, right? Pwede ba? Yes and region. no. Yes and no. <laughs> Kaya nga asymmetric sila eh. Iba mm -hmm. kasi yung context nila. Kasi uh, yung federalism kasi, hindi lang naman uh, uh, tawag dito, peace issues ang ina-address. Okay? Hindi lang ethnicity issues. May development issues. Mm -hmm. Pag in mo in general sa buong Pilipinas, development issues yan. Okay. Pero pag tinignan mo specifically sa Bangsamoro at sa Cordillera, hindi lang development issues yun. So, as a model, again, uh, lagi naming ine-emphasize, wala kasing one size fits all. Okay. okay? So, pwede nating tingnan yon in terms of uh, relationship with the federal government or the central government, but for us to say that it serves as a benchmark, medyo hindi enough na consideration yun. Just on the political structure, because I'm coming from the perspective of the ordinary person na on election day, sino yung iboboto namin? Um, maybe illustrate it in a way, like parang organizational chart, mm, um, okay. relationship between the federated regions and the local governments. And from the perspective mm. of the voters, sino ba yung mga iboboto namin come election time? Para lang medyo maliwanag pa Yung relationship nung um, uh, proposed Bangsamoro at LGU, uh, pareho doon sa lahat ng federated region. Kasi exclusive power ng federated region yung LGU. Kaya nga katulad ng binanggit ko kanina, yung local government code mo ay effective pa din. Ano? Pero ang magre-repeal niyan, hindi na ang federal congress. Yung federated region na ang magre-repeal magre nun. Sila na ang gagawa ng local government code nila. Kaya sila ang, kung gugustuhin nilang i-retain yung current era, nasa sa kanila yon Kung gusto nilang i-retain yung current configuration nila ng probinsya, ng munisipyo, ng syudad, ng barangay, nasa sa kanila yon Ngayon, sila din na magdidesisyon kung paano. Kasi doon sa regional assembly mo, doon sa lahat ng federated region na pinopropose, no? with the exception of Cordillera and, uh, and Bangsamoro, kasi nga asymmetric sila, 
eh, ang bumubuo doon mga representante ng constituent units. Sa so, madalit sabi, ang assumption mo dito, pag nag yung region kung anong gagawin sa pera at paano mag-generate ng pera, sino ang ia-appoint, anong opisina ang i-create, and so on, ang nag decision yung mga LGU mismo na naandon. Kasi yung regional governor mo, hindi mo directly elected. Hindi mo din dapat kasi i-direct elected. Pag ginawa mong directly elected, yun yung uh, pumupunta tayo doon sa danger ng mas matitinding warlord. Kasi mas malaking political entity, mas, malaking, mas maraming puder, mas maraming pera, tapos isa lang yung boss mo. Hindi, ang ginawa mo collegial yung boss doon. No? So, sa madali sabi, pag nag-decide halimbawa si Federated Tradition, uy, pwedeng isuspend si gover provincial governor ganito. Hindi lang decision ni regional governor yun. Decision nung assembly. Kasi yung regional government, yung regional assembly. Tagapatupad lang si regional governor. Consistent ito doon sa Bangsamoro, pero mag-iba yung klase ng pag-elect nila by congressional or legislative district sila. Okay? Hindi by constituent units. Yung Cordillera, iba din. May regional assembly sila na pareho nung lahat ng federated region na, na symmetric at saka ng Bangsamoro na elected by uh, constituent units, pero may directly elected governor sila. Okay? Kasi yun nga, yun yung tingin nilang mas bagay sa kanila. So, but essentially, in terms of uh, principles of governance, pareho. Yung struktura doon nagkakaiba. So, so in short, um, parang sa BOL, no? you will have the regional governor elected by the assemblyman, right. correct? Yeah. So, um, come election time, ako botante, boboto pa rin ako for the same set of officers right. plus assemblymen. Yeah. yeah. How many are those? Doon sa regular, uh, doon sa symmetric federated region, two members per constituent unit. Per city, okay. parang alimaw, city, two uh, per city. Hindi, ganito. Bawat, uh, cons ba bawat probinsya, boboto ng isa directly at isang proportional representation. No? Yung, isang, yung, yung PR mo, party yon na binoboto mo, pero ang nominee mo by constituent unit. So sa lista mo, let's say meron kang limang constituent uh, unit. Okay? Regardless kung anong configuration mo, doon ko probinsya, di sampung membro ng assembly yan. Yung lima doon, i-elect mo directly. Yung lima doon, by party, pero yung nomination mo, by constituent unit pa din. Okay. Um, taka lang, sir. Okay na yun. Yun lang pala yun. Okay. Okay na. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Tayao. Maraming salamat, salamat, Attorney Ordinario, and salamat, Assistant Secretary Malaya. Malaki Malak niyo press corps. Salamat. Stand by sa press con, the presidential spokesperson, Harry Roque, and back to our main studio sa Radio Pilipinas and People's Television Network.